Coming up on this Wednesday edition of Daybreak, a day after replacing some of her top aides, President Park Geun-hye expresses a strong determination to revive the economy and improve the people's livelihood. She also vows to root out corruption in the government and in the corporate sector. In its latest outlook, the Korean government paints a much rosier picture for the economy, citing stability in consumer prices, growth in employment and industrial output. Concerns do remain over weak consumer spending and external uncertainties. Plus, Iran's new moderate president stresses dialogue with the international community in resolving issues surrounding his government's nuclear development program. Hassan Rouhani, however, backs Tehran's nuclear activities, saying they're peaceful and legal. Daybreak begins now. You're watching Daybreak on Wednesday, August 17th. I'm Chi Yusan here in Seoul. We start this morning at the nation's presidential office. After carrying out a surprise reshuffle of our presidential staff, President Park Geun-hye is determined for a fresh start. Our Handan has more on what the Korean leader said during the first cabinet meeting since coming back from summer holiday. President Park Geun-hye, who replaced half of her senior secretaries Monday, is looking to start anew. During the first cabinet meeting after her summer break on Tuesday, the leader made clear that change will only come once the cycle of bad practices is broken and one that emphasizes values based on firm principles takes its place. Such remarks, pundits say, are partly aimed at her outgoing senior aides who failed to bring about change. Her former senior secretaries failed not only to take responsibility for a string of scandals involving presidential officials, but also to produce tangible results of her key policies, which include the president's vision of a creative economy as well as employment and welfare reforms. Also mentioning the corruption case in the nuclear power industry that led to halted operations at numerous power plants, the president reiterated the importance of stamping out corruption between firms and high-ranking officials. The comments reflect her strong drive for a political reform and her determination to expand the presidential shakeup to the cabinet in general. President Park, who also replaced her senior secretaries for civil affairs, future strategy and employment and welfare affairs, reaffirmed that the ultimate goal of her push for change is to improve the livelihoods of the people. And then, I did a news. On Tuesday, President Park also proposed five-way talks with the leaders from the nation's ruling and opposition parties to resolve partisan wrangling. The proposal comes after the ruling Senuri Party and the main opposition Democratic Party each respectively suggested three-way and one-on-one -on -one talks with the president. The ruling party welcomed President Park's counter-proposal while the opposition has yet to respond. The DP is thought to be pushing for its previously proposed one-on-one -on -one between the president and its leader. Meanwhile, the president voiced her opinion on the missing 2007 inter-Korean summit transcript for the first time since it became a political hot potato. She called the disappearance of the transcript an attempt to, quote, shake national discipline and erase history and said it should never have happened in the first place. At the National Assembly, the ruling and opposition parties have resolved some of the thorny issues that have been stalling the 45-day parliamentary probe into allegations the intelligence agency meddled in last year's presidential election. Representatives from the two sides announced Tuesday that they have agreed to extend the investigation period by eight days beyond the current deadline of August 15th. The lawmakers will also finalize the list of witnesses that will give testimonies at the hearing by later today. Three hearings will be carried out over a seven-day period on the 14th, the 19th and the 21st.
Both sides also agreed on the list of people who will be called in for questioning, which includes the former heads of the National Intelligence Service and the Seoul Metropolitan Police Agency. Tensions between South Korea and Japan may uh, ease a touch as Japan's Prime Minister and Deputy Prime Minister are likely to skip an upcoming visit to the controversial Yasukuni War Shrine. Our foreign affairs correspondent Hwang Song Yi reports on the plans for the anniversary of Japan's surrender in World War II, which is celebrated as Liberation Day here in Korea on August 15th. Japanese daily Asai Shimbun reported Tuesday that Japanese Deputy Prime Minister Taro Aso will not be visiting the Yasukuni War Shrine on August 15, the 68th anniversary of Japan's surrender in World War II. The paper said that Aso has never visited the shrine on this day in the past and said that's unlikely to change this year. The report comes a day after South Korea's Ministry of Foreign Affairs warned Japanese politicians against trips to the War Shrine next week. Worshipping at the Yasukuni Shrine by the Japanese government and political leaders is something that should not happen. We once again stress this fact. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe has also pledged not to visit the War Shrine on August 15, but a handful of politicians are scheduled to go, which may further escalate tensions between Korea and Japan. Neighboring countries see the shrine as a symbol of Japan's wartime atrocities. While relations between Seoul and Tokyo have cooled over Japan's continued claims over Korea's Tokdo islets and a string of historically insensitive remarks made by Japanese politicians, Japan has sought dialogue. We hope to hold the unconditional frank dialogue between the foreign ministers and leaders. President Park Geun-hye has yet to meet with their Japanese counterparts since taking office. And experts don't expect a summit anytime soon, as she has made it clear Japan must first take responsibility for its wartime atrocities. August 15th will likely be another hurdle for the two sides, as President Park is expected to remark on Japan's recent attempts to rewrite history, while Japanese politicians are expected to bow their heads to the war dead at the controversial war shrine. Hwang sang Arirang News. Some welcome news on the economic front. In its monthly report on economic conditions, the South Korean government says the economy appears to be on the road to recovery in the latter half of the year. Our correspondent Hwang Jie has this report. Recent economic indicators are raising hopes that the Korean economy will find its way back to recovery in the second half of this year. The Ministry of Strategy and Finance said in its Green Book on Tuesday that the nation's economy is showing positive signs amid stabilizing prices and expanding employment. This is the first time this year that the finance ministry has used the term recovery in its monthly report that assesses economic conditions. The book went on to say that major economic indicators such as production and investment improved recently. The economy created 360,000 more jobs in June from the same period a year earlier, while facilities investment and industrial output rose 4.5 percent and 0.4 percent in June from the previous month. Exports are also turning around. The Ministry of Trade, Industry and Energy data shows that the country's exports rose 2.6 percent last month from the same period last year. Exports dropped 1 percent in June. The finance ministry, however, cited the Federal Reserve's planned stimulus tapering as a factor that well, could have a negative impact on the Korean economy. The ministry also acknowledged that the recovery in the second quarter came largely from government stimulus measures, saying such government spending has limitations in boosting economic growth. The Korean economy grew 1.1 percent in the April to June period from the previous quarter, rising above 1 percent for the first time in nine quarters. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. If you want the latest news from Korea and around the world, okay, to return to the negotiation. President Park Geun-hye plans, given the current circumstances, on your way to work or at home, Defense Ministry. the legislature will convene a... Tune into Daybreak on Arirang TV. Prime 
Iran's new president Hassan Rouhani has opened the doors to diplomatic talks with the United States on Tehran's highly disputed nuclear program. Speaking in his first news conference Tuesday, Rouhani said he was determined to resolve the dispute and ready to enter serious and substantive negotiations. Rouhani's election victory over conservative rivals in June raised hopes for a diplomatic solution to the nuclear issue. Western powers and Israel accuse Iran of attempting to develop nuclear weapons, but Iran has repeatedly insisted its nuclear program is solely for peaceful purposes. Turning now to the political turmoil in Egypt, U.S. Senators John McCain and Lindsey Graham have urged the Egyptian military to release political prisoners and start a national dialogue while returning to democratic rule. The Republican senators were sent to Cairo this week by President Barack Obama to help resolve the crisis after the military ousted former President Mohamed Morsi last month. McCain and Graham also urged Morsi's Muslim Brotherhood, whose leaders, including Morsi, are sitting in jail, to end the violence and resolve their differences through dialogue. After meeting with Egypt's interim leaders Tuesday, Graham said the status quo in Egypt was unacceptable, while McCain called Morsi's overthrow a coup, a definition that contradicts the, Obama's, the Obama administration's stance on the issue. If considered a coup, the U.S. would have to cut off all military aid to the country. The United States has ordered its citizens and non-essential personnel at its embassy in Yemen to leave the country immediately because of security threats. The State Department said Tuesday that there is, quote, continued potential for terrorist attacks and that the security level in the country is extremely high. This comes after a U.S. drone strike reportedly killed four suspected al-Qaeda militants in the nation. Britain's Foreign Office says it has withdrawn all staff from its embassy in Yemen and advises against all travel to the country. The sharing economy is a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace, a fast-growing trend in which people rent assets directly from each other through the Internet. As the name suggests, using users share things with one another, even their own cars and living space. Kim ji reports on what the sharing economy looks like here in Korea. Airbnb is a U.S.-based web service founded in 2008 that aims to make it easier for people to connect and lend out space inside their homes at a low price. Its service operates in more than 190 countries and is the most prominent example of a huge new sharing economy in which people rent assets directly from each other, coordinated through the Internet. To stay in this traditionally built Korean-style home, it's $80. This is all possible due to home-sharing websites like Airbnb, which connects people like you and me to share their homes. Joe Gabia, the co-founder of Airbnb, says that now is a great time to start a startup business like his, with the emergence of mobile devices and smartphones that instantly connect people around the world. The reason that this is such a great time to get an idea out there into the world, to start a company, is that the the cost to do so has never been so low. You, you actually don't need investment to get an idea off the ground. Meanwhile, there's another startup company called Korea Car Sharing that provides a platform to share electric vehicles for the members of the public. Founder and CEO Ha Ho Sun said that technological developments have allowed the convergence of the appropriate hardware and software, providing the best platform for a startup company. Right now, the timing is good with high demand for cheaper and environmentally friendly ways for transport. Also, the technological advances make it easier for us to operate as platform providers for electric vehicles. Whether it's homes or cars, startup companies are using the sharing economy and finding ways to utilize the world's idle assets and provide a platform to make them more resourceful. Kim ji Arirang News. Have you ever thought about what will become of your online identity after you die? The issue of digital inheritance has become a growing concern as more of our lives are uploaded onto the Internet. Our Polly shows us the current legal roadblocks that families face and how you can leave behind your own virtual will. 
It's been nearly five years since Korean actress Chae Jin Shil died, but her public homepage still lives on in cyberspace. The site now acts as a digital memorial for the nation's beloved leading lady, as her fans continue to leave messages of sympathy and appreciation. Though many photos and journal entries remain online, there hasn't been a single update since her passing. Unfortunately, due to a lack of legal precedent, even Che's family members are unable to manage her account. Though there are no current laws that exist to allow family members of the deceased to gain administrative access, the personal site can still be shut down. However, some choose to live it up. The matter of digital inheritance remains a hazy area of law at home and abroad. It centers around the fate of our digital property, such as emails, online photos, and social networking messages after we die. In recent years, an increasing number of families have been voicing a right to reclaim their lost loved ones' online assets. International websites like Facebook and Twitter let users decide what they would like to do with their accounts after a period of time, whether it be giving a farewell message or deleting all information. Meanwhile, the growing public demand for such services has prompted Korean lawmakers to push for broader policies and practical solutions to this problem. When you join a portal site and give your personal information, you should also be able to specify what you want to leave behind. This is why a digital inheritance law is needed. As we upload more of our lives online, the more significant and larger our digital inheritance becomes. And in every case, a choice should be given to either leave it as our lifelong legacy or allow our family and friends the peace and closure they deserve. Paul Yi, Arirang News. And a good Wednesday morning to you all as we kick things off with the South Korean national football team. Now, of course, with Korea taking on Peru on the 14th at the Suwon World Cup Stadium, manager Hong Myung-bo announced his roster for the upcoming match. Now, despite speculations that manager Hong might bring in Park ju young he was left off the roster once again. But that's not all. The Lion King Lee Dong-guk was left off the roster once again as well. But at the same time, might be Egon Ho's last chance at proving that he's a national team material as manager Hong decided to choose him over the big man Kim shin -uk. And just like the East Asian Cup, the team will be without any European players as he chose 20 men instead of the usual 23. And from the South Korean national football team, we now go over to the South Korean national basketball team, who went up against Kazakhstan in the round of 12 Asian basketball championships. Now, after thrashing Bahrain the night before, the offense lights it up once again, beating Kazakhstan 71 to 47. But it wasn't just the offense that worked on the night as the defense kicks it up a notch as well, with Cho Sung Min and Yang dong helping Korea stop Kazakhstan's offense. Now, with the blowout win, Korea has earned a ticket to the quarterfinals of the 2013 Asian Basketball Championship. And now moving on to some Tuesday night KBO action as we take a look at the Red Hot LG Twins take on the scrappy NC Dinos. Now with the game taking place in Mazan Stadium, it's the LG Twins who draw first blood with Kim yong hees RBI ground out, which scores Son Ju in for the first run of the game. Next batter here, Lee Jin Young, he's going to come up to bat and RBI double to left makes it 2-0 LG Twins. Now we're going to shift over to the fourth inning super rookie Na Sung Bong, RBI single to right field, cuts the deficit to 2-1 LG Twins. But here come the LG Twins in the sixth inning of the game, Chung Sung Hoon deep to straightaway center field. This one, a two-run shot as LG takes a 4-1 lead. Shifting to the eighth, LG seals the game thanks to Lee byung RBI single as LG Twins take this game 5-1, your final score. And next up, the Red Hot Tucson Bears taking on the Nexon Heroes in Jamshir's second inning. Bases loaded, Min byung hans sack fly scores the first run of the game. 1-0, Tucson Bears. But now next batter, he's been red hot. Kim Hyun-soo pokes one to left. 
2-0 Tucson Bears. But what do you know, we're not done yet. The big man of the Tucson Bears, Chen Chun Suk, deep to center field. This clears the bases with a two-run double as Tucson takes an early 4-0 lead. Now we go over to the fifth inning. Bases loaded for Kang Jong Ho. Grounds one to second base. This scores a run. And what do you know? That's it for Nexon in the fifth. Shifting to the seventh. Lee Jong Wook deep to right field. A solo shot. That's his fifth of the season. 5 1 Tucson Bears. But here we go in the ninth inning here. Bases loaded for Nexon. Park Byung Ho walks 5 to 2 Tucson Bears. Next batter, Kang Jong Ho up at bat, drops one to left field. This scores two runners, and now it's all of a sudden five to four Tucson. Next batter, Kim Min Sung, he's gonna send this one to right field, and Min Byung Hun with the catch, ball game over. Tucson takes this game five to four. Now also with one game being rained out, the Lotte Giants beat the Kia Tigers 5-3 with Shane Yuming earning his league-leading 11th win of the season. Now with that said, of course, uh, with talent comes success and with success comes money, right? Well, it's no wonder Kim Yeon was recently ranked 6th in the list of highest paid female sports stars in the world. Now Forbes magazine compiled a list of some of the highest paid female sports stars and Kim Yeon raked in a total of $14 million in 2013. While she didn't make much with her prize money, most of the money came from the number of commercials and sponsors. Meanwhile, the top four highest paid stars were all tennis stars with Maria Sharapova topping the list at $29 million. And that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. See you guys again for your sports needs. Good morning, I'm Lee ji with your latest weather updates. Well, today's weather condition will be similar to yesterday, except it will be hotter. And as we can see, the lowest of the highest temperature will be 31. And what a heavy sudden showers we had yesterday afternoon here in the central regions. I mean, I didn't even expect to face that. But brief heavy rain is in the forecast again here in Seoul and the surrounding area in the afternoon today. But we should get less precipitation than yesterday when the isolated showers pass by. It will be even hotter tomorrow as Seoul is expected to reach up to 35 with lots of sunshine. So we'll have to deal with serious heat wave. In fact, it's only going to get hotter towards the weekend. Now back to today's forecast. Uh, right now we are looking at partly to mostly sunny skies. But uh, later on, we will be under the influence of the edge of high pressure system from North Pacific. So more clouds will be rolling into the peninsula, dropping southern showers at times. Now, heat wave advisor has been escalated to heat wave warnings to the uh, most parts of the peninsula. So it's going to be a very hot one today, without a doubt. With that, let's take a closer look at those hot numbers. Uh, now, the capital will climb up to uh, 33 as well as Busan, that's 91 degrees Fahrenheit, and Daegu will be steaming hot at 36. And let's see, um, this uh, for Gangju, and let's see how other regions are looking. It looks like Jeju will get up to 35, Daejeon 34, and Mount Kungang will be hiking up to 31. Now that's all for me at this hour. Have a great day, and back to Yusan in the studio. Thank you, Jian. And those are the stories we have for you at this hour. Stay with us for more on the day's headlines.